Well, this morning, we're going to talk about Noah and the giant half-breed mutant fruits. <laughs> ah, my favorite subject. Um, <coughs> there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that people don't really dwell on or focus on or spend much time on. And because of the fact that we don't really look at it that way, there's a lot of confusion in this world. And uh, some of you might not like uh, the first, first point that we go through, but for others of you, it might actually connect some dots for you that will help things to make sense. And if you really want to understand theology, and if you want to understand the Bible from beginning to end, this is essential theology that you're not going to learn most places. And uh, we'll get into that as we begin the study. But number one, man's wickedness was a part of the reason for the flood. But there was a bigger one. Man's wickedness was part of the reason for the flood. But there was a bigger one. There was a bigger reason besides just the wickedness of man. Something that created the wickedness of man and kind of spurred it on. So we're going to take a look at that. A. There was a time when the watchers fell from heaven and desired the daughters of men. Now the reason I refer to these beings as watchers here is because this is what Nebuchadnezzar refers to them as in his dream that, that he had, that he shared with Daniel. He said, I saw a watcher, a holy one. And they used to be called the watchers because uh, the concept was the angels were helping and intervening in the affairs of man. Now, angels don't necessarily have a will of their own. Angels follow the will of the Father. They carry out the Father's business. And so there was a time in the scriptures where it talks about something that, that some people don't quite interpret correctly. We're going we're to take a look at that in Genesis 6, 1 through 3. It says, Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Now actually, the interesting thing is, before the flood, if you study the Bible, you see that men had astronomically long lives. They lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. As a matter of fact, the oldest person in the Bible is Methuselah. And Methuselah lived for 969 years. Does anybody know what Methuselah's name means? When he was born, it was a prophecy. His death shall bring. Do you know what happened when Methuselah died? The flood. His name was prophetic. It means his death shall bring. The interesting thing is, if you go one chapter before Genesis chapter 6, and I've gone over this before, but um, just, just kind of as a recap, Genesis chapter 5 is a genealogy. And it's basically, it starts from Adam, and then it goes to Seth, because of the fact that, you know what happened with Cain and Abel? That got all messed up. So Seth became the next in the bloodline. So it goes to Adam, and then Seth, and then Enosh, and then... Well, every single one of their names translates something from English. Adam simply means man. It basically is the, it's the terms red and earth, but it means man. Seth means is appointed. Enosh means mortal. His son was named Kenan, which means sorrow. And, and so, as you go down uh, through, through, through all these names, if you translate them into English... If you take it from beginning to end, Noah's the last one before the flood. His name actually means comfort. But if you translate all of them into English, it says, Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching. His death shall bring 
the sorrowful comfort. And there's a prophecy within the genealogy of that. So we go straight in from that genealogy, which seemingly, you look at it in chapter 5, and go, that's just a bunch of names. Well, if you string them together in English, they mean something. Then we go into chapter 6, and now we've got this weird story about the sons of God being with the daughters of men. And first of all, what's wrong with that? Why would that make God angry? Didn't he create Eve to be Adam's wife? So now God's all up in heaven. He's really mad because people are getting married. How dare they marry women? Women should be left on their own. There's something deeper here. When you, when you take the, the, this, a lot of conservative scholars that say, well, the sons of God are actually, they, they're actually the sons of Seth. And the daughters of men are actually, they're the, they're the, they're the, they're the daughters of Cain. And they were mingled that they shouldn't have been. When you take that, it doesn't make any sense. Why would God be upset about humans getting together and getting married? So let's look at B. B, the term in Hebrew for the sons of God, the term in Hebrew for the sons of God is Benai Ha'elohim. This term is only used in reference to angels in the Hebrew scripture. As a matter of fact, this term is only used about three or four times in Scripture, and every time it's used, it's talking about angels. It's talking about angelic beings. It is never used in the Hebrew to reference people. Job chapter 1, verse 6 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God, the Benai Elohim, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan was also among them. Satan also came among them. Now the interesting thing here is, what is this talking about? Angels. Angels. This term is always used in reference to angels. So number one, we have the, the logic of why would God be mad about humans marrying humans. Number two, we have the fact that the sons of God, that term in Hebrew, is only used in reference to angels. And so... The next step in logic in looking at the scripture is C. Some scholars believe that the sons of God and the lineage of Adam and the daughters of man are the lineage of Cain. But where did the giants come from? Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. Proceeding on through Genesis chapter 6. There were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterwards, when the sons of God came to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. And those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Okay, so here's the, here's the problem. We got God getting angry about people getting married. And now, normal people getting married are having giants. Normal person plus normal person equals giant. If, if your theology says that, well, these are just people, this is, you know, the line of Seth and the line of Cain, how can two normal lines create giants? So there's, there's even a logical problem with assuming that this is just a normal situation. Now, as we, as we look at this chapter 6, as we begin to see what's happening here, we can ascertain that angels are leaving their estate, leaving their place of watching mankind, and because of the beautiful women that men were having, they were beginning to lust for mankind. And they began to have relationships with the women. And the result of this was a byproduct of that was very different from angelic being or human being. Now, if, if you were an angel, if you were an angelic being, and here's the interesting thing. The angelic beings were about eight feet tall. They had a very, they had a very interesting stature. 
I was, I was talking about this with a friend of mine the other day. I was sitting in the office and I was saying, I was saying, do you believe this, that, that there were these, these hybrids before the flood and that's part of the reason God wiped them out? He said, yeah, but God wiped them out and they were never, they were never on the earth again. And I said, well, that's not what the scripture says. Because the scripture says that they were there afterwards too. Now, is there any evidence of that in the Bible? Well, there's a dude named Goliath. And Goliath was a giant. There's also a guy from Bashan. His name was Og. He was the king in that area. His bed was 13 feet long. There's stories about David taking into captivity giant men who had six fingers and six toes on each foot. Coincidentally, my wife's grandmother had six toes on her foot when she was born. Not saying she's half angel. She had corrective surgery to take care of that. But there was, there's some interesting anomalies here. And, and, and the question that, that we have to ask is, number one, why is God so upset about this? Number two, why did it have to be wiped out? And number three, what was the purpose? What was the purpose in the overall scheme of things? Because when people fall away, people are either serving God or they're working against Him. So what did the enemy use with a bunch of fallen angels making hybrids with human women? Well, part of the problem that stemmed from that was it was corrupting the bloodline of mankind. For man to be redeemed, God had a plan. And what was God's plan? Jesus Christ. A man who would be born, a son of Adam. Perfect bloodline. Imagine if that bloodline was corrupted through hybridization. That sounds kind of weird. But let's continue. Let's continue to tell this story. Number two. God saves Noah's family through the ark. God saves Noah's family through the ark. Now we're getting into the story of Noah and the ark. And as you know, some people are like, oh man, I don't like the idea of giant hybrids and angels and men. That's just totally unreal. I like the story about all the animals in the world coming together in a big boat and being saved by one man. I like the story of the talking snake and the two naked people who ate the apple and all of a sudden all the bad things in the world stemmed from that. There's a lot of fantastical stuff we have to swallow. So just because you don't like one thing doesn't mean... So we're going to talk about this story. First of all, as we talk about these giants, as we talk about these angels, if, if you were a fallen angel and the humans were kind of naive around you, how would you present yourself? You would probably present yourself as a god. Because you had extraordinary powers. And, and what would you... You would probably either present yourself as either a traveler from another planet or a distant place... Or you'd present yourself as a god because you couldn't explain your different appearance and you couldn't explain the different things that you could do. Now, there's nothing in mythology at all about gods coming down. And there's nothing in mythology about gods breeding with women creating hybrids, right? No. There's nothing like that in our past. There's nothing like that. Anybody ever heard of Hercules? Yeah. You know who Hercules was? He was the son of Zeus. But his mother was immortal. And you can go back into you can go back into history and you can find all these stories about this hybridization. You can go back into Mesopotamia text and you can find about this, this race of giants that came on the earth. They called themselves the Anatoki, and they said that they were gods. 
And they, they, they demanded to be worshipped. They demanded to be given women. You could study these things and you could find... Do you know what the amazing thing about the flood is? In this world, cross continents, all these different cultures that we have in this world, there are over 400 cultures in this world that when they tell their creation, legends, stories, or myths, they start with a great flood. Is that a coincidence? Is it a coincidence when they travel over the seas? When the, when the pilgrims came overseas and told the Indians the story of the great flood, the Indians looked at them and said, Oh yes, we know the story of the great flood. How? You mean that, that thing really happened? <laughs> See, we've got all these different cultures, and they all line up, and there's a lot of things. If you would study history, a, a lot of the things that they use in college today to get kids not to believe in the Bible, if they would go one step further and study the synchronicity of it all, they would completely believe in the Bible. Because there's no way that it's possible for, for all this transcontinental continuity. So why was Noah saved and spared? A. Noah was not genetically dysfunctional because of hybridization. Now, of all the points I've ever given in every sermon that I've ever preached, that is one of the weirdest points I've ever had. <laughs> Noah was not genetically dysfunctional because of hybridization. <laughs> You go up to most preachers and you say that sentence and they'll look at you like, huh? Oh. They're like, what? Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Noah had a little Bible under his hand. And Noah wore a three-piece suit. And Noah was a part of the Gideons. And Noah was a good man. No, he wasn't. You know, Noah had a little problem, though, too. The Bible. <laughs> uh, that's just between you and me. Just between you and me. You like the grapes. After they're spoiled. <laughs> so what does the scripture say here? Genesis 6. Still in Genesis 6. See, God, the Bible talks about God destroying the earth. And it's all in Genesis 6. And the stuff that we just read at the beginning of Genesis, it's all a part of this story. And if we don't make it a part of the story, we're going to miss it. And then we're going to miss a bigger picture of what's going on in society today that, that will come about towards the conclusion of this matter. It says in Genesis 6, 9 through 10, This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. What does that mean? Perfect in his generations. It means his bloodline was pure. He hadn't been messed with. He hadn't been, he hadn't been altered in any sort of way. For the redemption of mankind to be met, Jesus Christ had to be born as a son of Adam through that bloodline. So Noah and his wife and his children were spared. The Bible also says Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So Noah had three sons. He had his wife. He walked with God. He cared about God. He, he offered sacrifice to the Lord. He was a follower of God. And he was also perfect in his generations. So God chose Noah on the basis of, of not just the relationship, but also his bloodline too. B. Noah and his family were saved by the word of God and their obedience to it. Noah and his family were saved by the word of God and their obedience to it. Verse uh, 13 of Genesis chapter 6. It says, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. 
Make rooms in the ark, cover it inside and outside with pitch, and this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. It's width 50 cubits. It's height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark. You shall finish it to a cubit from above and set the door of the ark on its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters to the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh, which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die, and I will establish my covenant with you. You shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you, and every living thing of all flesh shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. And you shall take of yourself all food that is eaten. You shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. Here's the interesting thing. If Noah was a modern day believer, God might have said, Noah, yes Lord, hallelujah, praise God, I hear you. I want you to build me an ark. Lord, I am building a spiritual ark in my mind right now. <laughs> let it be done, let it be so. I'm going to go watch some TV. See, sometimes when God calls us, He wants us to do something. There's a lot of Christians that just want to believe. I tell you, if you really read through the Bible, if you read the Bible from cover to cover, it's hard to believe. There's a lot of challenging issues in here, and there's a lot of questions that we have. And, and even <coughs> believing itself can be hard, but sometimes God calls you to go further than just believing. He calls you into action. He calls you to do something. He calls you to prepare. He says, he says, here, this is an important time for you. And it's time for you to begin working on your life. It's time for you to begin making changes. It's time for you to prepare for something that is going to happen that is not going to be positive. But you're going to be okay if you follow my instructions. If you follow my voice. If you do what I'm asking you to do. And the cool thing is this. Noah obeyed God. And because of his obedience, because of his diligence, because of his hard work, he was rewarded with life. Guess what? Every single one of you are related to him. And if it wasn't for his hard work, this planet would look like Mars right now. Noah heard the voice of the Lord. And he obeyed it. And because of that, mankind was saved. Because God used him. And Noah realizes this. Noah realizes this. See, Noah offers sacrifice to God once on dry land. And God makes a promise to mankind. Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, took of every clean animal and every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter, oh, oh, oh winter, and summer. Please come quickly, summer. And the day and the night shall not cease. So basically Noah builds this altar and gives sacrifice to God. God says, I'm never going to destroy the whole world with a flood again. This is, this is it. And so even after that, even after that time, there were still watchers falling. There were still things happening. Did you know there's scriptures we don't understand because we don't know about this? 
There's a scripture that Paul gives in Corinthians that says when women come to the church, they should cover their heads. They should wear a veil. Why does Paul say that? For the sake of the angels. What's he talking about? That's kind of weird. Angels think women's ugly, so they got to cover their faces. There's all kinds of stuff in the New Testament that references this. Now, every time we go through a generational change, there's a paradigm change. And when a paradigm change comes in, it basically means we believe different things. And in order to, in order to follow us and to, to, to do what they need to do, they have to change with the times. Because if you want to be relevant, you got to change with the times, man. So are we still being bombarded today by watchers, possible fallen angels, who are still doing the same things that they were doing in Genesis chapter 6? Yes! Land sakes, yes! Watch the History Channel. Watch Discovery. Watch these things about UFOs. And watch what their primary purpose is. They have witness after witness after witness that talk about being abducted. And the reason that they were abducted was so that they could be genetically experimented on. For what? Hybridization. The exact same thing that was going on thousands of years ago. Now, right now, we have it in our society that anybody who believes in UFOs or aliens, they're crazy. <laughs> You're an idiot. You're crazy if you believe that. Although I believe all the evil came from the world because two naked people ate an apple then a talking snake made them eat. <laughs> I believe donkeys can talk and people can walk on water. I believe the dead come back to life. But you believe in aliens? How rude. I'll tell you. I believe in angels and I believe in demons. I believe demons come into people and make people go, but guess what? I don't believe in aliens. That's just ridiculous. See, the weird thing is, if, if we start getting freaky going, I don't know, believe in that, and I don't believe we got to look at our own stuff. we got to begin to analyze this stuff, because I believe with all my heart, I believe with all my heart, that the reason there's such a popularity right now with science fiction, and with a lot of these alien abduction stories, and ancient aliens, and all this, is because it is the same deception that the enemy has always perpetrated. And he is going to use it for end times. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. So shall it be when the Son of Man comes back. So we have to be on guard. We have to be vigilant. This is important that you know this. You may go, this is kind of weird, but... Someday you may go, oh, wow, that's cool. I know what's going on. It's deception. Number three. Let's get back to let's get back to our carnal reality. The ark story teaches us that there are three keys to making it through the storms of life. Three keys to making it through the storms of life. Three keys to doing to, to making it through whatever comes our way, whether it's the end times or whether it's it's the beginning of times, whether it's happy times or sad times. There's three things Noah did that helped him through, that can help us through. A, listen to God's voice. Listen to God's voice. Luke 8, 16 through 18 says, No one when his little lamp covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a lampstand, that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Therefore take heed how you hear. For whoever has, to him more will be given. Whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken away from him. You have to listen to the Lord. Because God will increase your knowledge. He will increase the, the things that you need to, to survive and to make it through life with God's blessing. If you listen to him. B. Follow God's instructions. Follow God's instructions. 
Noah didn't just listen to God, but he obeyed God. It took a while to build the boat. He had to get out of his comfort zone. Like the lady in the video that we watched this morning. He had to get out of that comfortable area and go into that area of hard work. And the ark wasn't built overnight, folks. It wasn't like a, it wasn't like putting together a model. It took years and years and years, and it took his family working. And you can imagine building an ark in a place where it didn't rain. It's ridiculous. You don't need an ark in a place where there's no water to go sailing in. People looked at him and mocked him, and he went through that storm. But it didn't matter because he was obeying the voice of God. And sometimes when you obey the voice of God, sometimes when you hear the voice of God, and you do the things God asks you to, people are going to look at you like this. <laughs> Don't worry. It'll connect with them. <clears throat> when it starts to rain. Hopefully it connects before. The Bible says in Psalms 119, 76, 72 through 76, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in your word. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let, I pray, your merciful kindness be my comfort according to your word to your servant. Follow God's word. That will be your comfort. That will save your life. If you, if you follow his instructions and see... Get in and stay in the ark. Get in and stay in the ark. You know, once that door was sealed to that ark, it was shut. It was sealed shut by God. Noah couldn't take out a, a, a saw and go, I forgot my jacket. Shh, 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 shh. That would be stupid. When you're in Christ, stay in Christ. John 15, 1 through 8 says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me. Jesus is our ark. And I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine... Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. This is my Father, but this... By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. How do we bear fruit? How do we have lives that, that bear fruit, that shine lights for others? By abiding in Christ, by remaining in Him, by staying in Him. And it doesn't matter what the enemy tries to do to us, and it doesn't matter what the enemy tries to bring against us. If we abide in Christ, we're in that ark. If we, have, if we have come through the cross and, and asked Jesus to forgive our sins and repented and we begin to walk with Him and talk with Him and have that relationship, we are in that ark and God has sealed us with Him. We remain in Him. So listen. Obey. And abide. And no matter what's coming down the road, you're going to be okay. You don't have to freak out when you hear about shootings or dead birds or dead fish. Just trust in God. Listen for His Word. And you'll know everything's going to be alright. Make sure that your relatives and your loved ones 
And those around you have that peace too. That's your big responsibility. We can't save the world, but we can lead our friends and families to Christ. Make that your responsibility. Don't try to save the whole world, because you can't do it. But you can witness to your neighbors and your co and the people that you care about. Let's bow our heads. Have a word of prayer. Father God, this morning I pray that we would be challenged to follow you. Lord, I pray that we would follow you with such a zeal that we would listen to your voice and hear you and follow your instructions in such a manner that people would see something in us that would cause them to want to know you more. Help us to witness to our family members, our friends, our loved ones. Lord, we can't reach the world, but we can reach our neighbors. And if all of us would reach our neighbors, we would reach the world. Lord, I pray that you would give us a heart as we come into these last and final days to witness for you, to love you, to make you the focus of everything. And Lord, help us not to be depressed and discouraged because of the present times that we live in, but help us to be motivated, invigorated, to follow your instructions, to begin to make the preparations so that our friends and our family can know you, so that no one has to be left behind, God. Help us to walk in your nature and your love. And I pray these things in Jesus' name.